Board of Governors of the Irrigation Association Certified Irrigation Designers Program welcomes your interest in this study series. I'm Ken Klein, speaking on behalf of the Board of Governors. The Certified Irrigation Designers Program was developed by members of the Irrigation Association in order to increase professional development and the quality of irrigation designs. We commend your interest in the program and we thank you for adding to our industry's professional growth. Certification is a three-step process. Step one consists of registration, verification of the required years of industry practice, and adoption of our code of ethics. Step two is a general industry exam that covers the topics of soil plant water relationships, irrigation scheduling, basic hydraulics, pumps, basic electricity, and irrigation terminology. Step three requires choosing the agricultural or landscape turf general exam and then completing one of the three specialty exams offered in that area. Upon attaining certification, you'll receive a seal that you are encouraged to use on your designs, promotion through the Irrigation Association's directory of CIDs, and advertising in other media. But the most important thing is that you will have made a declaration that you stand for and support responsible professional irrigation practices. This step two study series has been prepared by the Board of Governors to help with your preparation for the step two general industry exam. We have compiled and edited several technical presentations and both the videotape and the printed material are presented here. These presentations support many of the topics you'll be tested on in the Step 2 exam. These technical presentations were delivered at the Irrigation Association's yearly exposition. The Board of Governor takes this opportunity to thank these speakers for their willingness in helping to prepare this study series. Hello, uh, my name is Charles Burt. I'm a professor of agricultural engineering at Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo, California. This is a presentation on soil plant water relations made for the Irrigation Association for its uh, general education and training purposes. Uh, along with this videotape, there's also a, a written script uh, which you can use to follow along. Now, taking a look at soil plant water relationships, uh, there's quite a bit to learn on it and so this is going to cover the basics it uh, it certainly isn't going to be an advanced course but there's uh, there hopefully is enough information in here to allow you to uh, distinguish between what's uh, just kind of interesting and what's fairly important to know to begin with the soil itself from an agricultural and also from a turf aspect serves three functions the soil acts as a moisture reservoir in other words, it holds water. It just acts like a bank account, essentially, for water. And uh, some of the water is available. You can withdraw it, and then you put water back in. So it's a reservoir. Uh, it also acts as a nutrient reservoir. You put nutrients in, in the form of fertilizers, and the plants take it out. And the third function <coughs> is where the soils have to have, uh, they provide mechanical stability for plants. The plants need something to hang on to. I'll be talking primarily about the moisture aspect. We have quite a few questions to ask, things like uh, what in the world is a soil moisture measuring device? What kinds are there? Uh, when to irrigate? How much to irrigate? How is it different for various crops? I'd like to start out with an introduction here, then on soil texture. If you take a look at the slide, which depicts a soil texture triangle, what you see here is when you say you have a soil that's a loam soil, for example, actually a loam soil is categorized by the sizes of soil particles that are in it. On the texture triangle, on the outside of it, you see three words. There's clay on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, it says silt. And on the bottom is sand. Those three names designate various particle sizes. If you had a sample of soil and you stuck it in a beaker of water and you shook it up 
until all the particles were loose and independent, and let those particles then fall down through the water. They would fall at various rates, and you can categorize them by size. The, the big particles fall sooner than the, than the small particles. And you say, well, this soil then has a certain percentage sand, that's big particles, a certain percentage clay, and a certain percentage silt. Take the loam again as an example. Looking at the bottom of the triangle, let's say you had a soil that had 50% sand in it. Those are the large sizes. 20% clay, looking on the left-hand side. Now look at the 50% sand and 20% clay. They intercept in that loam area. Let's say 50 plus 20, that's 70%. The remaining 30%, if you follow the line up and to the right, would be silt. So a loam could be composed of 50% sand, 20% clay, and 30% silt. On the other hand, you could have a soil which was 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay, and that would also be a loam. So soil texture, the soil texture, such as a clay loam, a loam, a clay, a silty clay loam, is determined by the mix that you have, or the various percentages of clay, silt, and sand. Well, uh, how's that important? Uh, it is important for a number of reasons. Uh, one is uh, if you tend to have tighter soils like clay soils, they're also called heavier textured soils, generally the water doesn't go in as fast. Uh, also the clay soils uh, will generally hold more water than the sandier soils. In terms of the various constituents there, if you look at the nutrient capability, the nutrient holding capability of a soil, the nutrients are held by the clay particles. They're not held by sands or silts. It's the clay that gives you the nutrient holding capability. Plus organic matter holds nutrients. I'd like to go to the next slide. Here, it's a slide that shows various structures. Now the texture is something that you can't change. That's what you have. It's going to be different for every depth in, so in the soil. The structure is something which you can manipulate. In fact, uh, typically our problem is that we destroy the structure or we make it poor. Structure deals with the way the individual particles are held together. Now, of course, you get a sand, just a pure sand, and the particles aren't held together. That would be called a single grain structure. But you get a clay, for example. You know that a clay can, you go out to a piece of ground and you you pick up a sample of soil and a clay can be a massive block. You can't even break it apart or it can be nice granules. Now you take a blocky piece of ground, essentially it could be massive, doesn't have many pore spaces that you can see, it looks kind of sterile and the water just isn't going to go through it very well and the plant roots don't grow very well. How do you get a situation like that? The structure, or in other words, the way those soil particles are held together and the amount of pore space you have can be affected by things like water chemistry. Uh, did you go out and plow the ground or did you drive a tractor over it when it was wet? Just squash that ground down so you don't have many big pores left. Um, do you have just constant traffic over it that squashes the soil down? That's not the quite academic term, but the thing is you can manipulate the structure. You can improve the structure by going out and growing crops, leaving the residue in the ground, enhancing it with more organic matter, uh, not, not working the ground when it's too wet, and also proper water treatment if you have certain things like high sodium, high bicarbonates, that type of thing. There's some chemistry things we can do. <coughs> if we take a look now at a typical loam soil, and this is just hypothetical, and a lot of these graphs are going to be hypothetical. If you look at a hypothetical loam soil, at a certain moisture content called field capacity, which I'll define in a bit. Essentially, it's the moisture content you have after an irrigation. And you had this sample of soil. Let me just say you had a glass here. You had a glass right here, and you went out and, and somehow you, you squashed it in the ground. You didn't squash the soil, but you cut it. And this was filled up with undisturbed soil here. Now, what you do is you get a hammer, and you squash it down. 
and you squash it down till all the solids are down in the lower part of the glass here. There are no pore spaces left. You would have squashed the water out. So now the water that was in those pore spaces is above the solid. And then there's some air because of course some of the pores were not full of water. You would have just as a ballpark estimate for a typical loam soil that you'd sampled after an irrigation, you'd find it about half of this was solid material. That means that half of the soil originally was pore space. And maybe half of the pore space was filled with water. So let's see, half solids, a quarter water, and a quarter air. Gives you an approximate idea of what that soil is composed of. Looking at soil moisture terms, something that I'll, I'll get into a little uh, in a bit more depth here is the concept of soil moisture tension. Uh, we need to cover that a bit because it, uh, it's going to be used in defining terms like field capacity and available water holding capacity. Uh, what's soil moisture tension? Well, it's, it's like a pressure or a vacuum. Uh, another word, let's see, we would use potential, we'd use tension, they're, they're essentially synonymous, the same word. The soil moisture tension deals with the tightness that the soil will hold water at a certain moisture content. Now the thing is, it's a function of the moisture content. If you have a dry soil, the water that's in the soil at that moisture content is held quite tightly by the soil. It's not readily available for the plants to use. Now if you get a moist soil, one you've just irrigated, and you wanted to extract some of the water out of that soil, you would find it's not very difficult. And so there's a large tension, you might say, and actually we have it as a negative number, a large tension if the soil's dry, but a rather small tension if it's moist. So with a moist soil, the water is actually more available. And it turns out then, in a moist environment, not too wet now, but a moist environment, if the water's readily available, plants will use more water, or at least they won't be restricted in their water use than with the dry soil. Now for the three basic terms you need with soil water. Let's say we have a piece of soil here, and uh, we put a sample in here, in this jar right here. And I have some water in there. Let me just empty the water here. But let's say we have a sample of soil in here. Now. The soil is composed of air, water, and solids. Let's say that we fill it up, we put water in it, until the water is actually standing at the top of the glass. It's saturated. What saturated mean? Saturated means that all of the pores, all of the little holes, are full of water. Not air, but water. That's saturation. It's full of water and soil. There's no air in here. Now, if I was to drill a hole in the bottle, bottom of this glass, what would happen is the water would start to drain out. Not all of the water, just some of the water. That's what happens in the soil. Of course, we don't normally have a, a little bottom on it that we drill a hole in. It's a deep soil. When we irrigate, when we irrigate, we actually don't get the saturation. And I'll explain that in a bit. But the soil will drain a bit after you stop irrigating. And there's quite a bit of water left in the soil. And when that drainage is stopped, that's called field capacity. Now the plants use the water. And some of the water evaporates off. And if the soil gets quite dry, so dry in fact that the plants now would irreversibly wilt. So they can't get the water fast enough. They irreversibly wilt and they would die. At that moisture content, that's called permanent wilting point. So we have three terms, saturation, field capacity, and permanent wilting point. Saturation again. What saturation mean? All the pores are full of water. There's no air. And again, keep in mind that uh, contrary to what, what's often thought, we don't saturate the soil during an irrigation. Just imagine if we filled all the pores with water when we were irrigating, the roots would have no air. And it just so happens that roots 
have to breathe. If they don't get enough oxygen, they die. So every time we would irrigate, we would put tremendous stress on the roots, and that isn't what happens. So we actually have quite a bit of air in there. Now, at the very top of a soil, for example, on a furrow irrigation, you'll have a small zone. It's about that deep that it'll be saturated. But below that, it's not saturated. It's above field capacity, but it's not saturated. Field capacity then. What is field capacity? Field capacity, I mentioned, is the amount of water that's retained in the soil, or it's that moisture content, about 24 hours after an irrigation has occurred. There's some drainage of water. And then the soil is able to hold the rest of the water, essentially, against gravity. That's field capacity. It has nothing to do with plants. It's simply a soil characteristic. It's not related to the, the plant uh, ability to take up water at all. Now, it turns out that at field capacity, there's a certain tension with which the water's held. It's able, the soil is able to hold the water against gravity. And that tension, we put a number on. In other words, if we actually measure the tension, how hard we'd have to pull to get that water out, the tension would be about minus 0.1 bar. In other words, it's a vacuum. We'd have to exert a vacuum on the water to pull it out. That's pretty close to zero, about a tenth of a bar. What's a bar? A bar, one bar is about 15 PSI. You're familiar with that, pounds per square inch. The thing about field capacity is that, in general, we can use that basic definition. It says, well, you want to know what field capacity is? You irrigate, you go out 24 hours later, about 24 hours later, when you think the drainage has stopped, you measure the moisture content, that's field capacity. That's fine for most conditions. There is an exception, however, that is or can be quite important. And this graph illustrates it. it. It illustrates what happens actually in a situation where you don't have a plant growing, where you have a crop, excuse me, where you have a soil, and there are two soils shown here, a clay loam and a sandy loam. And if you read the bottom of it, it says water content in the soil versus time. So that's time in days on the horizontal axis and moisture content on the y-axis. Let's see, it's water content versus time after a complete irrigation. So you've, you've put water all the way down to the bottom of the root zone. And now you have no soil evaporation. You've put some plastic on the top. There are no plants growing. And every once in a while, you pull the plastic off, and you measure the moisture content in the soil with depth. Take a look at a clay loam. What can happen with some clay loam soils is that you'll find that the drainage does not stop in about one day. It doesn't stop in two days. It won't even stop in eight days. Again, that's a condition with no plants growing and no surface evaporation. Now, if a plant was growing, the, the drainage would stop because the plants would use that readily available water first. So you wouldn't have the water left over to drain. But where this is important on these heavy soils is in a situation where we pre-irrigate. And we do a lot of that in California out in the west. We say, hey, we have this bank account. We can store water for later use by the plants. Now the, the storage can come through winter rains. And of course, that's been done for years with dry land crops or we can fill it up with an irrigation. And so the concept is, hey, we have a soil. It'll hold this much water. Let's put that much water in it and save it and use it later on. That's fine. Except in some soils, what happens is you fill it up and you say, yeah, that's how much it'll hold. And it turns out it doesn't stop draining. And you may lose as much as 20%, 30% of your water, something we hadn't really realized in the past. You lose that much water due to slow drainage. What's the solution? You just don't fill it up all the way. You anticipate that slow drainage. You fill it up this much instead of that much. And you allow the drainage to occur, which in the end just fills up your whole root zone. So you don't waste the water. So pre-irrigation is actually a good practice. It's, it's quite good because it gives you a reserve there. But you don't want to overdo it. Now what you see on this graph here is that the sandy loam soil sandy loam soil doesn't have quite that problem. The drainage really does stop after about a day. Permanent wilting point. Again, what's permanent wilting point? Well, that's when the plants really start to have trouble. 
The soil is dry enough to cause permanent wilting, irreversible wilting. Now, there's still a lot of water left in the soil. It isn't that the soil is dry. It's just that the moisture that's left is held too tightly by the soil. And the plants can't get it easily enough. And now, the tightness with which it's held, of course, we can measure. That's a tension. And we put a number on it, and it happens about negative 15 bars, negative 20. And you know what? It doesn't make much difference if it happens at 15 bars or 20 bars, because it turns out that the moisture content at either one of those tensions is about the same. At any point, at some tension, it's very difficult for the plants to get the water. And of course, we don't want the soil as a whole to get that dry. OK. OK, so what do we have so far? We have saturation, which generally doesn't occur when you irrigate except for a very small zone with surface irrigation right on the soil surface. By the way, uh, if you want to know if the soil is saturated in a field, um, that, that really occurs when you have a high water table. And uh, that's when you dig a hole. You go out, you dig a hole, and you look down in the hole, and there's water standing in the hole. Ah, you know that's saturated. That's what really uh, saturation is. So we have saturation. All the pores are full of water. We have field capacity. That is this um, definition of the amount of water that a soil holds after free drainage, which is a fairly constant number in some soils, but is a little bit more dynamic in the heavier soils. And is particularly something you have to pay attention to with pre-irrigations or really storing water. That's the upper limit of storable water determined by the soil. We have permanent wilting point, which is the lower end of available water. Now, in between the upper limit and the lower limit of storable water, that's field capacity and permanent wilting point. These are two zones. That's our bank account that we play with. That's what's called the available water holding capacity. And we put uh, numbers to it, for example, is inches per foot. Available water holding capacity is the difference between field capacity and permanent wilting point. There might still be a, well, quite a bit of water left, but it's not available, so we can't play with it. We have values that we uh, give to different soils, and these are determined by lab analysis. And uh, the slide here shows you a few general numbers. These are just approximations. You should always use analyses from the Soil Conservation Service or from a, a local consulting lab. But these give you approximate values of inches of available water, that's between field capacity and permanent wilting point, per foot of soil depth. For example, you have a fine sand. A fine sand won't hold as much as a clay or as a clay loam. Look at a sandy loam. That's a very common texture. And by the way, this is by texture, and the structure will also influence it. So these are ballpark numbers. The sandy loam might hold about 1.25 inches of water, available water, per foot of soil. Now let's see what that means. That means, let's say, say we have a glass of water. This is a column of soil. A column of soil is one foot deep. It has been dried out to permanent wilting point. The plants can't get the water anymore. It's, the remaining water is held too tightly by the soil. It's one foot deep. And it's a, sandy, a typical sandy loam soil. If I had this glass coming up, and that's a column of soil, and on the top of it, with the same area as that, I stacked up 1.25, 1 and a quarter inches of pure water. And there was a little piece of saran wrap on it. And I pulled the saran wrap out, and that water went into the ground. It would go down exactly one foot. That's what that means. In other words, that soil could hold one and a quarter inches of water, available water, per foot of soil. So if I had four foot of soil at that moisture content, permanent wilting point, I had four feet of soil, I would need four times one and a quarter inches. I would need five inches to bring that soil up to field capacity. If I put exactly five inches in, the concept says that the water would percolate down to the soil exactly four feet and stop. That's it. And the whole soil zone 
would now be at the same moisture content. It would all be at field capacity. That assumes, of course, a uniform soil all the way down. And uh, that doesn't happen. So what we really have to do is we have to take a look at soils because you have sandy loam in one zone and a clay uh, the next two feet or so. And then this slide shows you an example of how the available water holding capacity for a typical root zone is determined. What happens is you dig holes and as you go down, you say, well, this is, uh, for example, a, a loamy sand on the top, for the first foot and a half, and then the, another distance, maybe a half a foot is another texture, and another foot and a half is another texture. And you take it and you add up the various pieces. And you say, well, in this soil, we have an available water holding capacity in this root zone depth of 6.6. .6. By the way, what's a root zone depth? Uh, the root zone depth that you want to work with is not how deep the roots can go. It's the zone you want to manipulate. For example, a root zone uh, depth could be quite deep on a cotton crop. It could go down eight feet. But maybe what you really want to play with, you want to manage the top four feet or the top five feet. That's where you want the activity to take place. And so that's the zone that you're, you're really interested in. Spend a little more time on that later. Now here's the graph that starts to get a little complicated. This is called a soil water characteristic curve. What it does, it brings together the concepts of water content and tension or potential. Let's take a look at the graph. On the right hand side is zero on the horizontal axis. That's zero tension, zero soil water tension. Zero corresponds to a saturated condition. The water is very loose. You don't have to exert any tension on it to pull it out. As you move to the left, there's a little bit more tension you would have to exert. Just a little bit, in fact about a tenth of a bar, and you're at field capacity. By the way, the tenth of the bar occurs out in the field. Uh, for a lab analysis, they use a third of a bar. But uh, it's fairly close in tension to zero. And then, as you dry the soil out, Let's take a look at the clay, for example. As you dry the soil out, you notice that the curve drops. It says you're decreasing in moisture content, and the tension is getting more and more negative. In other words, you have to pull harder and harder to get the remaining water. Finally, at about minus 15 bars, we have permanent wilting point. For example, for the clay, it looks like we have about, oh, 28% water by volume still remaining in the soil, but it's unavailable. The thing about a soil moisture characteristic curve is each soil has a different depletion at the same tension. Now, these curves uh, are a little complex. And you know, in reality, if you're working with irrigation system design and even irrigation management, you rarely run across these. But it, it's extremely important to understand the concepts that are shown in the curves. The thing is, you see, at each depth in the soil, you have a different soil texture and structure. So you're going to have an entirely different curve. But still, you have to ha answer basic questions like, um, how often should I irrigate? And what's the criteria to say I should irrigate now? And then how much do I put on? And those concepts are explained by understanding these curves. So I'd like to spend a little bit more time on it. Here's one idea here. With each soil, you have a different depletion at the same tension. Let's take a look at a curve on it. Take a look at the clay. On the right-hand side, on the bottom, it says field capacity. It says a clay has about, it looks like, a, this is just a hypothetical curve now. The clay may have, oh, 48% water by volume in it at field capacity. Now, sandy loam may have, it looks like, oh, 13% by volume at field capacity, different moisture contents. Let's say we start out with two soils, a clay and a sandy loam, and they begin to dry out. In other words, the curves drop. And when they both reach a tension of 
minus two bars, we take them and see how much water remains. If you take a look at the curve, at two bars, at minus two bars, the curve on the clay has dropped quite a bit. It's dropped to well below 40%, or about 40%. So you've lost about 10% of the moisture content, excuse me, 10% by volume. On the sandy loam, on the other hand, it's dropped to a minus two bars, and you've lost a different amount of water. So the tension, if you're going to irrigate a certain tension on a clay, you have to put in a different amount of water per foot of soil to bring it back up to field capacity than you would on a sandy loam. And by the way, plants respond to tension. They don't have any idea how much water is left in the soil. Just take a look on the left-hand side of the curve. With a clay loam, you have quite a bit more water left in the soil at permanent wilting point than sandy loam. Plant could care less how much water is left. What it sees is a tension. It sees, ah, uh, negative 15 bars. It doesn't know that the clay loam still has more water in it than the sandy loam. It just responds to the tension. So if you're going to irrigate by tension, if that's the guiding principle you're going to use to irrigate when the plants sense a need for water, you're going to apply different amounts of water for different soil types at that time. Maybe not in a season, but you'll have a different number of irrigations and a different amount per irrigation depending on the soil texture and the root zone depth. Going on to another concept then which I've just mentioned. A clay has a greater available water holding capacity than a sandy loam. Take a look at the graph again. I've already gone over this a bit, but now you're looking at the difference between field capacity, the moisture content at field capacity, and the moisture content at permanent wilting point. The clay goes from, on this hypothetical curve, might go from 48% or so at field capacity to 28%. It says for every 10 inches of soil, for every 10 inches of soil, you have two inches of water, available water. The sandy loam, on the other hand, doesn't have much of a drop. It goes from, oh, 14 percent or so at field capacity to maybe 6 percent at permanent wilting point. It's an entirely different amount of water that's held between the two zones, between field capacity and permanent wilting point. Another point. The way soils lose the water is differently. Now, sandy loam doesn't hold very much water. But the water that it does hold, it's not very much. But the available water that is held is quite available. Whereas a clay might hold a lot more water that's available. But the availability is a different degree. If you used half of the available water in a clay, the plant would see more stress than on a sandy loam that has been depleted by 50 percent. And that's shown on the curve. Take a look at the curve here. What you see, looking at the right-hand side of the curve, a sandy loam doesn't drop very much, but most of the drop occurs on the far left, on the far right-hand side, whereas a clay has a bit more even drop throughout it. In other words, of the sandy loam soil, most of the water that will be lost will be lost actually before the tension gets greater than about one bar. So it's fairly readily available. Next idea here. We have a concept of depletion then. Finally we get to how often to irrigate and how much. Most people don't really understand the concepts of tension and most people don't have tensiometers or devices which measure the tension. So what you really have to go by is you say, look, at, I know the soil holds six inches of available water, or you're irrigating with turf, and you say the soil uh, has a small root zone, and it'll hold one inch of water. The question is, how much do I dry it down? And the number we identify with is inches. So you say, I, I really have to put on an inch net, or four inches net, or two inches net. That's the number you identify with. The way you obtain that number is through the understanding of tension, however, and the effect on plants. Because the percent that you deplete the soil by, for example, are you going to deplete 50 percent of the available water or 20 percent, is going to be dependent on a variety of things. So here's some examples. We call this 
MAD, Management Allowable Depletion. By the way, if you have a 40% MAD, that means you will let 40% of the available water be used up before you irrigate. If you have a 60% MAD, you will use up 60% of the available water before you irrigate. Okay, what goes into the, the selection of a, a specific MAD? A low MAD, what does that mean, by the way? A low MAD means small, frequent irrigations. A high MAD means less frequent, larger irrigations. Common perception is if you put on a lot of small irrigations, you put on a lot more water. No, that's not the case. If you look at a whole year, let's say you had 40 inches you have to put in, a high MAD might be four 10-inch irrigations. A low MAD would be 10 4-inch irrigations. The total is the same. I'll explain a few differences that occur later on. And there's some system problems that may occur. But the MAD by itself, the selection of a certain percentage, does not influence the amount of water you put on over a year. It does influence the amount of water per irrigation and the number of irrigations you need. Low MAD. Why would you irrigate frequently? Well, if you have a shallow root zone. Uh, and of course, there, there are various extremes. Um, a shallow root zone doesn't hold very much water. Now, uh, it, it may be a soil uh, which has most of the water readily available, such as uh, sandy loam. But if you only have a foot of water and you dry it out halfway, you don't have much water left. And if you don't irrigate frequently, let's say if you really dry it out till it's almost dry, if you're off by one day, you've lost it. See, you don't have much margin. So anytime you have a shallow root zone, a very sandy soil typically, low water holding capacity, that's the main idea. If you don't have much in your bank account, you don't want to draw it down too much because there's nothing left. You want to always keep a reserve in there. That's a cause for selection of small frequent irrigations. You have certain systems like micro irrigation, which would be consistent of, uh, it would consist of drip, or microspray. What's the characteristic of those systems? Well, drip only wets a small portion of the soil volume. It may be 30 percent, uh, it may be 40 percent. Microspray wets a little bit bigger area, you know, and it all depends on the spacing of the trees and spacing of the emitters or the sprayers. But basically you're not wetting all the soil. That essentially is the same as a low water holding capacity because you only have a small reservoir in here, and if you dry it out too much, you might just run out of water. So you have to really keep those systems irrigating quite frequently, putting in small frequent amounts. That's just the name of the game, or else you run out. You don't have any buffer there. There's some crops now, like strawberries, onions, uh, certain ornamentals that have to be kept quite moist. That would be a low MAD. Uh, of course, there's a whole range in, in ornamental uh, plants. Uh, and you know that some things like ferns have to be kept quite a bit moister than uh, other more drought tolerant plants. Uh, certain crops like strawberries. Strawberries uh, just simply don't do well. You don't get good fruit quality if there's any stress to them. And the stress occurs at a very small depletion. In other words, if you get a tension of about uh, a third of a bar, the things start to stress on you. Whereas you get other crops like cotton that don't really show anything until quite a bit more soil moisture tension occurs. You get other crops like onions, certain root crops, uh, where really you're not too worried about any stress transpiration problems. You're interested in keeping the soil moist so you get good sizing. The plants don't have to force their way through the soil. They, they can size the way they're supposed to. Now you have certain critical stages of growth. For example, on corn. If you have corn, and you're in a pollination stage, and you have these tassels. Let's see, you have a pollen that comes by. Here it comes, and it has to make its way up the tassel. If that tassel's dry, it's not going to make it. What's it mean? You don't get a little kernel of corn. So there's a, a real critical period there in, in the life of corn and other crops where if you just stress the crop a little bit for a few days, you can get dramatic decreases in grain yield. So there's certain times. Other times, it doesn't make much difference. 
And then you have the idea of salty water. Give you an idea here with salt. Let's say you have a, a piece of salt here. Here's a piece of salt in the water. Here it's in the water. And there's a plant root out here, and it looks at this piece of salt in the water. Ready? It sees a, quite a bit of water and just one piece of salt. It's fairly dilute. Pretty easy to take the water out of the soil. Now, if that soil gets dry, and this is just soil water we're looking at here, and now you have half as much water left with the same amount of salt, what the root sees really is twice the concentration of salt. It can't count the molecules. It just knows the percentage of salt in the soil. And the idea then with salty water and salty soil is you try and keep the pores full of water to keep that salt dilute. That's the idea. Now, the concept of MAD, or depletion, has nothing to do with the concept of leaching. That's another matter entirely. Leaching has to do with what percentage of the applied water should go below the root zone to wash the salts out. And that's a separate matter. Uh, you always have to wash the salts out once a year or so uh, to prevent a buildup. MAD deals with how dry do you let it get before you irrigate. Well, at first glance, you know, you might be inclined to say, uh, well, why not keep plants as moist as possible because they might grow better and do better things. Uh, well, there are some restrictions. I'd like to go over some reasons why you might have a high depletion, high percent depletion. One of the reasons is the system type. Uh, generally, when we have systems that are moved by hand, such as hand move and wheel line sprinklers or side rolls. See, if you can have one sprinkler cover as many acres as possible, you have to buy less equipment. And the way to cover as many acres as possible with one piece of equipment, one line or one sprinkler, is to move as many times as you can, which means get back as infrequently as possible. So you tend to stretch things out. You tend to say, how dry can I let this crop get without really running into trouble, and I'll get back in that time. That's the idea with hand move sprinklers or wheel lines. Now, it's, it's different when you have a solid set system, and I'd categorize solid set systems as systems that aren't moved by hand, things like uh, even a center pivot or a linear move, or for turf grass, if you have a permanent sprinkler set up, or for ornamental uh, around buildings, that type of thing. Essentially. Generally, you have a network of pipes. And you know, it really doesn't take a lot more labor to irrigate once a day, five times a day, once a week. You generally, often you have a time clock. And uh, it's, it's very easy to get a low MAD. It doesn't cost you any more because your system is a permanent system anyway. You can whip a center pivot around in one day, in two days, you know, in three quarters of a day, depending on how fast it'll go. And it doesn't cost you any more or less. Uh, however, there are cases with those solid set systems where it's actually quite important to dry out the soil as much as possible without damaging the plant now because you actually do not want the soil to stay too wet. And that's primarily in a high evaporative condition, especially when it's very dry, in other words, and very windy. Because what happens is when you irrigate with these systems, any one of those systems, a permanent under tree sprinkler uh, for shrubs, for grass, for a center pivot, for a linear move. You see, when you irrigate, you're virtually always going to lose the moisture in the top couple inches of soil. And if that's all you put in, that, that water, by the way, isn't used by the plant. That's just lost to evaporation, plus you have wet foliage. If that's all you apply, enough water to get down that deep, and you put on little small amounts, like you run a center pivot real fast, and you only put on a tenth of an inch or two tenths of an inch in a pass, the water only goes down that deep because that soil is real dry on the top. If it only goes down that deep, you lose it in evaporation, and the plant never sees it. Now, supposedly, supposedly, you'll read in some places, and there's always a question of, let's see, if you have more evaporation, there's only so much capacity in the air for water, you know, so much heat, so much wind, so much relative humidity. Now, if that water is evaporated instead of going through the plant, uh, probably the plant won't need as much water. Well, that's true. Except what really happens, what I've seen, is it, it doesn't balance out. And it can be real dramatic in some cases. Uh, an example I'll give is uh, uh, set up in a fairly arid environment, you might call it, in Saudi Arabia, where, see, what happened is they would start to irrigate with a pivot, 
and they noticed, hmm, over there it's starting to get dry. So we'll speed the machine up and get over there, get water on that piece of ground. And so they operate the pivots as fast as possible. Now that, that hasn't just happened in Saudi Arabia, it happens here in the United States. We do it with linear moves, for example, it's a common mistake. Okay, what happens when they whip that machine around fast is it all goes into evaporation. By getting people to slow down the machines, to move them as slow as possible without having runoff, you can actually see the difference. You can walk behind a pivot that's moving fast and the soil is bone dry. And you'll walk behind another pivot that was started on the same date, same conditions, same amount of water, and the water will be down to five feet in the ground. It can actually happen. And it's the same thing on a variety of situations. You get high evaporative conditions on under tree sprinklers. Certainly on turf grass it can happen. It's, it's very dramatic. So what you want to do there really is uh, not stress the plant, but you want to dry, uh, you want to dry out the soil as much as possible so the percentage of water that you lose as evaporation will be minimal. Another thing, conventional furrows, and I want to underline the word conventional. Conventional furrows and border strips with long runs. Two things here, long runs and conventional. If you tried to put on a one inch irrigation on a long furrow, you said, let's see, that's one inch deep, that much wide, by that long, that's a certain volume of water. So I apply a volume of water to a furrow, and you want a one inch irrigation, it'd get about a third of the way down the furrow and stop. The rest of the furrow wouldn't even get any water. In other words, that's impractical. So you need certain moisture deficits just because you have travel time to get the water down. And the water goes in the ground fast initially. Now there, there are things that you can do about it, of course. That's why I want to underline the word conventional. You can use surge flow. You can run water down wheel runs. And of course, you don't need the long runs. That's an option, a design option. But with conventional surface irrigation, you just about have to operate with high MADs just to get the water down and get it in uniformly. Then there, there's some other cases. For example, almonds. Let's say this is an almond tree here, or a walnut tree. And you're getting ready to harvest it, and they're all the nuts up here. Well, the way they harvest these things is they have a machine that comes up and grabs a trunk. And it just shakes it like mad, and all the nuts fall down. And if that trunk was all nice and moist and just really nice and soft, all that bark was soft, when you shake it and the, the little claws come off, the bark comes off with it and the tree has a little bit of a tough time. So what they have to do is they have to deliberately stress the trees to the point where the bark dries out a bit so you don't have bark damage. Cases like that. Uh, there's some things like, uh, some crops like wine grapes. If you irrigate too much, the problem is you don't get the sugar content. You don't get the the wine quality later on. So there are some cases where you want a high MAD during part of the year and a low MAD during another part of the year or where it's system dependent. So there's no one real easy answer. Now down to some basic truths, some basic concepts. I will reiterate some of the things I've said and uh, expound on them a bit just to kind of go down a one, two, three list here. Basic truths, what do we have? Number one, the amount of water at field capacity, at permanent wilting point, and the amount of water between the two points, in other words, the available water holding capacity, will be different at every soil and at each depth. So there's no one common number. And you have to have a handle on that. What's the available water holding capacity that you're looking at for a particular design? Number two, when you irrigate a soil, here's a soil, and you put water on the top. Now how in the world does that water move down? Okay. The idea is that when you put a little bit of water in on the top, or even if you flood the surface, that water begins to go into the soil. It won't get from this point to this point until this point has reached field capacity. You see, by definition, field capacity is the moisture content which the soil can hold against gravity. The soil won't let the water go down any lower until you have a higher moisture content here than field capacity. So, the way the water goes down is it fills up a series of little microscopic zones. It brings this up to field capacity, and then any additional water that comes down goes on past it. it. Brings this up to field capacity and goes on down. This slide will illustrate it. What you have here is essentially a series of little buckets. It really isn't little buckets, it's pore spaces. And 
what you see is that the water won't even get to the bottom of the root zone until all of the soil above that has reached field capacity and exceeded field capacity so there's some water remaining to go down. In other words, if you have a soil that needs four inches of water to bring it up to field capacity and you put in three inches of water, that three inches of water will go down to a certain depth and just stop. And the bottom of the soil is never going to get that water. That's the concept. It doesn't sort of redistribute itself up and down the root zone. It just stops. Now, I've mentioned the problem of slow drainage, which can occur on heavy soils. And, but even with the slow drainage, it isn't going to suddenly creep down there and slowly bring the whole thing up. It will creep down a step at a time. If there's some extra water that drains down, it has to bring the next zone up to field capacity before it goes any further. After an irrigation then, do you have the same moisture content in the whole soil? The answer is no, because the soil is different. Unless you define moisture content as saying, ah, it's at field capacity. There won't be the same amount of water, but there will be the same tension. The tension of the water here, and here, and here, and here, if you brought the whole soil up to field capacity, will be the same. If the water has gotten that deep, say a day after an irrigation, where uh, it's not maybe on a small grass plot, you know, where the root zone is real shallow, but let's say where there hasn't been appreciable water uptake by plants, you go out here, the tension will be the same at all levels, but because it's a different type of soil at different levels, the content won't be the same. The availability will be the same. And the point that all this will be at is field capacity, a tension of about 0.1 bars. Well, there isn't a whole lot of soil water movement once you get to field capacity. Uh, as the soil dries out, let's say you have a piece of soil over here and a piece of soil here, just that far apart. You don't find this water migrating over here. It just doesn't work that way. You'll get a little bit of migration if there's a root right here and there's some root hairs literally this far away and it, you dry out the zone right here the roots have come in, they've extracted the water, you'll get a little bit of movement about that far, but you don't get movement this, this far in the soil. Uh, it just doesn't work that way because what happens is as the soil dries out, there's a tremendous resistance to water movement. And sure, there's a difference in energy between here and here. It's drier over here, it's wetter over here, you think the water would move. Yeah, there's a tendency. And as, a, as the soil gets drier over here, there's a greater tendency for water to flow. But the resistance in an unsaturated condition is so great that you have minimal, if any, water movement. What that says is if you have a drip system and you have an emitter here, and an emitter here, and an emitter here, and it's a new tree right here, and you have a dry zone between emitter wetted areas, and that soil is bone dry, that water from this emitter isn't going to creep over here if the wetted pattern comes down here and the wetted patterns don't intersect. This water is essentially unavailable for the plant because it won't creep over there. It doesn't have any way of knowing it needs to go over. Now, if there isn't much movement, that means let's take a look at this soil profile again. You fill it up to field capacity and just let it sit. Say, well, how much is going to evaporate off? Well, you will get a lot of evaporation on the top. But if this dries out, again, the resistance to movement gets so high that really you don't get much migration of water from down below. Now on heavier textured soils, you get more evaporation than on sands up here. You get more wicking action. But, but in general, you have evaporation that's pretty well restricted to the top few inches of soil in typical irrigations. It doesn't really draw on water from down here. For one thing, let's say this dries out a bit and you have plants growing. Well, this is the most active area for roots. They're going to be taking water out. The whole thing gets drier. It gets drier here from evaporation. It gets drier here because of the plant roots. And there, there just is too much resistance for this water to move up and evaporate off. So evaporation in general isn't real important, unless all you do is put that much water in the ground. If you put that much water in the ground and that much evaporates, you're in trouble. But with our typical irrigations that irrigate down to here, this is a small percentage. This is a graph right here which illustrates the concept of evaporation. There's a stage one and a stage two. 
And what it shows is that there will be a high rate of evaporation that's on the vertical axis there. One indicates you're at potential. There'll be a high rate of evaporation for a certain amount of time. In other words, there will be some water movement up to the very surface. And after that, the rate of evaporation tapers off rapidly until you're down to next to nothing or nothing. And again, uh, on a slide like this, what you see is that uh, you don't just have the soil by itself. You have roots in here, which are also drying out the soil. So the evaporation is fairly minimal on cyclic irrigations. But it can be very high on frequent irrigations in a desert environment. Another concept, the concept of this available water. So you put water in the ground, take out the piece of salt here, and uh, you brought the soil up to field capacity. Um, while you're irrigating now, the moisture content was above field capacity. While you're irrigating, plants are using water. Therefore, it can be assumed, and it's true, that plants can use water at moisture contents above field capacity. Field capacity does, is not the upper limit of plant water availability. It's the upper limit of the soil's ability to hold the water, but it's not a plant limit. Another concept, how in the world do plants use water? How do they get the water? Uh, here's a plant, and it has some roots, and it has some leaves up here. And here's the ground. How does the water go from here to here? Where is the pump? Well, there isn't any pump. You see, the way a plant works is as a big straw. It's really crude, but essentially it's like a big straw. There are roots coming down here into the ground. They're exposed to the soil water. There's a big demand up here for water in the dry air. And there's a change in energy of the water from here to here, which is always the cause of water movement. And essentially, it acts like a big straw. The plant is a conduit. Now, in the process of conducting the water, it's also conducting nutrients. And that's essential for plant growth. But they don't pump water. Now, if you stress a plant, Let's say uh, there isn't enough moisture down here. And so there isn't as much conductance of water. What happens to the leaves? The little stomata, the little holes on the bottom of the leaves close up. And that's a protective mechanism, so the plant doesn't dry itself out. What happens? Well, when the stomata close up, they don't let as much water vapor out. And they don't let as much carbon dioxide in. Carbon dioxide need needed for photosynthesis, which makes plant material. So if you stress a plant for water, you close off, you don't let enough water go through the straw. The straw closes down, but it isn't just water vapor that's affected now. It's the whole plant metabolism. So the photosynthesis doesn't occur, and you don't get the yields. But there isn't a pump right here. You don't cut them apart and look for pumps. Another point. The root zone of a crop changes with time. Well, that's important to know because, because when you're putting in soil moisture measurement devices and you put in a device here today, uh, really the active part of the root zone may be in another spot tomorrow. It doesn't change that fast. But it's important to know how, how the available water holding capacity changes with time and uh, you know, how the lateral movement occurs and how the vertical movement occurs. And, and on annual crops, it changes essentially daily up to a certain period of time until a crop gets a certain size. And your reservoir that you have to play with changes then with time as the roots get deeper and deeper. It's not a static thing. The concept of roots hunting for water is one that's uh, typically brought up. But you know, roots don't go hunting for water. Roots grow where it's fun to grow. They grow where there's a good moisture content, good temperature, plenty of nutrients. So generally they grow, in other words, at the upper, in the upper part of the root zone where there's uh, plenty of air, plenty of nutrients. But let's say it dries out in that zone. So you have a zone that starts to dry out. And there's another zone over here that's moister. The roots haven't expanded into that area. Well, if it gets tough to grow here, they'll start to grow where it's a little easier to grow. And they'll extract the water. But if you have a zone here where it's just dry, it's below permanent wilting point, those roots don't go on recon missions. They don't go across the desert looking for water because they don't have any knowledge of water out there. They stop growing where it's not good to grow.
And so if you want the water if, to be used over here, you have to make sure that there's a moist pathway for the roots to get out there. And you'll find that happens in soil. You'll find as you dig down through soil, you'll have zones that might dry out or zones that hold a fair amount of water. And you'll actually find pathways of roots that go out to another area. They didn't go out there hunting for water. They grew in those areas because there was enough water to grow there. And they just kept expanding and expanding because other areas dried out. And they expanded, and then they maybe got to an area where it was better to grow. But that's just because of the way they were. Another concept here. The patterns, the extraction patterns, I've mentioned this before, change by time the crop and the soil. And we do have a, a typical relationship which we use. It's called the 40-30-20-10. That's easy. 4, 3, 2, 1 relationship. It says, look, you have a root zone depth here from the top to the bottom here. And looking at the graph right here or the slide, you see that this shows that if you broke the total root zone into four sections, each one representing 25% of the soil depth, this is just typical now of, of many crops, you'd find that of the water that was taken out, between irrigations, about 40% of that water would typically be used from the top 25% of the root zone. 30% of the water that was used would be from the next 25% and so on down. And why is that? Again, at the top of the root zone you have plenty of air, plenty of nutrients, that's where the activity takes place, that's where the water will be taken up initially. The idea of pre-irrigations and storage, I've mentioned that. Um, it's true that often pre-irrigation may be wasteful. People irrigate too much during the winter. They put on more water than the soil will hold. That, of course, can be a wasteful practice. But the concept of pre-irrigations, the concept of storing water is a very valid concept. And it's a matter of how it's handled, not the fact that a pre-irrigation is bad. Pre-irrigations are very good for some crops. It gives you that reservoir, that reserve, emergency supply that you may not have later on. I mentioned this. Next concept before, the ease of plant water uptake depends on the tension, not the moisture content. Plants don't know how much water is in the ground. They do know how much tension they have to exert to get the water out of the ground. And what you see here in this graph, this is a fairly important graph, which is another way of illustrating the soil water characteristic curve relations. It's not a soil moisture characteristic curve, but it's a graph of what happens. If you take a look at the axis here, on the bottom it's soil moisture depletion by percentage. Zero percent is uh, it's at field capacity, a hundred percent is permanent wilting point. And then the vertical axis shows relative transpiration rate by percent. A hundred percent means if the plant could use a third of an inch a day, it's using a third of an inch a day. Fifty percent means it's stressed and it's the water's not as readily available, and it's cut back on the transpiration rate. The stomata have closed down. What you see here is, and this is, uh, this can be argued exactly how it occurs, whether straight lines are proper, but the basic idea is, is valid. Is that a plant will start to shut down slightly, it will reduce transpiration, and it doesn't go to zero, it gradually reduces transpiration once the soil moisture tension reaches some certain amount. And take a look at a sandy loam, for example. A sandy loam on the right-hand side, beginning at the top, a plant in a sandy loam soil may transpire at 100% rate until 75% of the water, the available water, has been used up. And at that point, then, transpiration begins to decrease. And as the soil dries out further and finally gets permanent wilting point, the rate of transpiration decreases. On a clay soil, if you notice, transpiration begins to decline at a different percent depletion. But if you notice, where the graph starts to drop on either the clay or the sandy loam, you're talking about the same tension. You're talking about different moisture contents, but the same tension. That's the thing that the soil moisture characteristic curve brings together. Next point, then, at the same MAD, and I've mentioned this before, at the same percent depletion, a clay loam needs more inches of water to reach field capacity than a sandy loam. What you start to see here is that you don't say, if you have a cotton crop or you have a grass crop or anything like that, uh, whatever you're growing, 
the, the right answer is not you should irrigate with two inches every time. What you really need to know is how deep the soil is, what kind of soil it is, and what type of crop it is. And based on soil moisture tension, some knowledge of that, the point at which a plant begins to decrease transpiration, for example, or the stage of growth, you say, hmm, okay, I need to put on, for this condition, that translates to a certain number of inches of water that I need to put on net. And of course, you have to bump that up for inefficiencies. Mention this comment here, the plants need oxygen in the root zone. You see they need carbon dioxide in the, in the upper part, in the leaves, for photosynthesis. But in order for, to have respiration, in order to have active uptake of nutrients, you actually need oxygen in the soil itself. And of course, you don't have oxygen if you have bad structure, you don't have enough, or if it's uh, a very high water table, if it's saturated, for example, the oxygen can't get in. I'd like to begin on plant evapotranspiration. I've mentioned it a bit, but there's a real important point here regarding plant ET. And it has to do with what I'm going to get to is you have a drip system, you have a sprinkler system, you have a surface system. Which system requires more water? Typical question. Comments like, I change from system X to six, system B, and uh, gee, I only needed half as much water. Okay. We have two concepts here. One is a concept that a plant needs water. The other concept is we have a pump. How much water does a pump have to put out? The way I want to handle it here is we take it by pieces. You first deal with a plant, and you say, how much water does a plant need? Looking at it from a simplistic standpoint, which I'll detail more, says the amount of water that a plant needs depends on how much of the area, if you look down from a plane, what percentage of the ground is covered by canopy. For example, on trees, once you get up to about 70% canopy cover, you're essentially at 100% ET. Depends on the type of plant. Citrus trees have a different leaf structure than almond trees and peaches and cotton. And so you have different rates of evapotranspiration. And the climatic conditions, whether the wind's blowing, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, that's going to affect the evapotranspiration. That's a combination of evaporation and transpiration. Those are the things, the primary things, that affect the rate at which plants use water. Now, where's the irrigation system in here? You don't see it on the list, at least right here. And so here's the important point. If you design a system for micro-irrigation, which only wets half the ground, and you design another system, sprinkler or surface irrigation, which might wet 100% of the ground. That in itself does not have an effect on the plant water usage. You see, the plant water usage is determined by the leaves in the air. It isn't determined by how much of the ground you're wetting. It's dependent on what's going on up here. If you can put all the water the plant needs in 50% of the area, the plant will still use as much water as if you use 100% of the area because the ET is determined by what's up there, not what's down here. Unless, of course, you restrict it down here. In fact, in fact, if you go back to other comments that I said about evaporation, if you keep a soil surface moist, you actually have a higher evaporation rate. It turns out that for many of our systems that have frequent irrigation, such as microspray, we actually have a higher evapotranspiration requirement than the less frequent irrigations, maybe like furrow or some under tree sprinklers. We actually have to have a higher net amount of water that the plants need. Because the water is more available, you have a higher evaporation rates. And if you have more the, the water more readily available, the plants tend to not be stressed, so they perhaps transpire at their maximum rate. Now that's good. I'm not saying that if you add, if, if you need 15% more water on drip than you do on surface, that that's bad because the idea of irrigating is to have the plants use the water the right way. And maybe it's good. But the, this is a, a common concept that if you wet half the ground, you only need half as much water. That's totally false. Now getting down to devices and how in the world do you monitor things? Let's say, I say, I want to be a good manager. 
of my turf grass or my cotton crop or my trees, and so I want to measure something. Uh, there are a lot of things you can measure. Look at the, the graph here or the uh, slide. Here are some of the things you can measure. You can measure soil moisture content, how much water is in the soil. That's one thing. You could measure soil moisture deficit. How much water do I need to bring it up to field capacity? Number one and number two are, are very different things. See, one just says you have a certain amount of water in the soil, but it doesn't tell you how much is available or how much you need. The second one says how much you need. Number three says how tightly is the water held by the soil? That doesn't tell you how much is in the ground or how much you need. It just says how tightly it's held. That can be used, for example, to tell you when to irrigate, but not how much. Number four is plant stress. Some people say, hey, let's not mess around with the soil. Let's just take a look at the grass or the crop, whatever it is, and uh, somehow measure the plant stress. And if the plant begins to stress, or right before it begins to stress, we know we should irrigate. Of course, that doesn't tell you how much to put on. It's similar to soil moisture tension. It tells you when, but not how much. I'd like to begin with the typical ways that uh, typical measurement techniques and here there are dozens of techniques so I'm only going to go through a few. Number one is gravimetric sampling. What's gravimetric sampling? Well you have some equations here. Gravimetric sampling is something we used to do but it's very rarely done now on a commercial basis except when you're calibrating instruments or having some research. We don't do this on a typical day-to-day -day basis certainly. But to get some numbers like to develop soil moisture characteristic curves you need to know how much water is in the soil at a certain tension. And so the procedure is, you go out and you get a sample of soil. You get some so soil in here, you put a lid on it, you take it into the lab, you weigh it. The weight, of course, is the moisture, con it's the moisture plus the soil plus a can. You stick it in the oven, take the lid off first. Stick it in the oven. You bring it back out. You weigh it again. The weight is the, the can, the soil minus the water. Well, the difference in the two measurements, and specifically the way the math works out, if you look at the, the slide here, it says if you took the wet weight minus the oven dry weight over the oven dry weight, that's just to the soil, not the can. That, by definition, gives you percent moisture by mass, in other words, by weight, you might say. Of course, that doesn't tell you much because you say, well, <clears throat> that's 14% uh, by weight, so what? We are getting inches of water or by volume. We need to know how many gallons to put on, not how many pounds. So you can convert from percent by mass to percent by volume, and the factor is the soil bulk density, and that's another type of measurement. It says if you have a piece of soil here and you have a cubic centimeter, one cubic centimeter of dry soil, how much does it weigh? And we have numbers, for example, like uh, 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter. Might be a typical soil bulk density. You multiply the two together, you get percent by volume. Now, the, the next step, of course, is, is to convert it to inches of water. And if you have one, uh, let's say, 100 inches of soil, and it has 10% available water by volume, see 10% of 100, that means you could extract 10 inches of pure water from that reservoir. Going on, what else do we do? We have a, a technique called soil moisture by field. And here's a graph that's a little difficult to see. But it's a graph, it's a field chart, very commonly used. It's, it's very commonly used by people who have other fancier instruments. The, the idea is this. You go out and you dig a hole. As you dig the hole, you bring up samples. You dig the hole with an auger. You bring up samples foot by foot, and you feel the soil. You feel the soil, then you say, uh-huh, boy, this soil is really hard. Let's say it's a clay soil. And these little clods are really tough to break. It must be dry. Sure enough, we need quite a bit of water to bring it up to field capacity. And you know, you get pretty good at it. And you go to a table like this, and it says, well, it's a clay loam. You think it's a clay loam just by the way it feels. And it's pretty hard and dry. I need so many inches of water per foot of this dryness to bring it up to field capacity. And you go down, and there's a different moisture content at every depth. Now with clays, it's pretty easy to use this fuel method because a clay feels very different if it's dry and it's cloddy and tough, or if it's moist and you can actually make a ball out of it or fairly wet and you can ribbon it out. 
and it actually comes out. It it's really feels different if it's wet or dry. Sand is a little tougher. This is not a real good technique on sandy soils because the sand feels like a sand if it's dry or wet. Sand doesn't make balls. It doesn't ribbon out. It just has individual grains. And so it's tough to determine the moisture content on a sand by feel. But actually, this is a pretty good technique. It, it's certainly not computerized, but uh, there's real value, especially in ag, to go out and dig holes. Because if you go out and dig holes, maybe for verification of other instruments, you're not locked into a single site, for example. And so you look at a hot spot over here, and you just go over and dig a hole. And you find out if they're restricting layers. You find out if, how deep the roots are. And you take a good look at the soil, and you know for sure what's going on. Sometimes we have a tendency at the beginning of a season to say, we're going to stick an instrument here or here to make a measurement. And you know we're boxed in the whole rest of the season, even if it, that isn't a real good location. We tend to box ourselves in. Or one other thing that you really have to be careful of with other instruments, which I'll me uh, mention here, for example, neutron probes or tensiometers, is they will give you a very accurate measurement of what's going on at the site. For a device like this, or even if you have a soil moisture uh, by field method or use a neutron probe, which I'll mention other devices, you always have to, to address the question of where in the world do you put it in the field. Mm -hmm. Generally, the concept is you put it where you think you would have the driest spot. And uh, then say, how many do you need? Generally, we put these, as you see in the slide, you put several. Uh, close to each other at different depths. That gives you an indication of whether you're drying out from below or, uh, and also what's happening up near the active root zone. Typically, we we'll use the upper one to indicate when to irrigate, and we use the lower one to indicate that the water got deep enough and it's not drying out. So we had an adequate irrigation. Uh, then the question is, where do these go in relation to the plants or the trees? Should they be in the tree row? Should they be five feet away from the trunk? How far apart? And you know there are not any magical answers on that. And that's why you can't go exactly to, to a book and that says, uh, of course you can go to books that say this, but uh, you don't know exactly if it's correct, at exactly what tension should I irrigate. Now, that's something you really have to uh, find out for yourself by taking a look at the plant, in the, taking a look at the plant stress, taking other soil moisture samples, and then you can get yourself online and know what the various measurement means. Because you're going to take a measurement at a specific point, try to extrapolate that for your whole field. Another type of device is an electrical resistance probe. And there, there are new ones coming on the market. The one I have shown on the left here, it's not my graph, uh, excuse me, my figure, but it shows gypsum blocks. A uh, gypsum block is a small little block of gypsum with two electric probes in it. You run a current through the little device. If it's wet, the electricity goes through easily. If it's dry, it doesn't go through as easily. And depending then on the resistance for electrical flow, uh, you can get an indication of the moisture content of the block, which indicates the tension in the soil. So this is really an electronic tensiometer, you might say. You see, it doesn't tell you the moisture content of the soil. But if you have a block, if you have a block of gypsum, it has pores in it, and the amount of water that go goes into the pores depends on the tension in that block and the tension in the soil. The tension of the block and the tension of the soil have to be identical. At that point, there won't be any water movement. So you're really measuring tension indirectly through a resistance measurement. The neutron probe is a rather common one in agriculture. This is a picture of a neutron probe. Uh, it's not recommended that you take the probe out. Uh, normally, it's kept inside the shield. Uh, it's set over a tube in the ground. The tube may be six, seven feet deep, aluminum tube or PVC tube, and it's dropped down. And there are little markers uh, on the cable, the electric cable. Every so often, you can see one above and below the hands there, uh, generally at one foot increments. And you push a button on that device, and it does a count. Now, what does it count? Well, the neutron probe emits neutrons. It's radioactive. It emits neutrons. The neutrons go out and into the soil, into a, a zone about the size of a football. So it doesn't measure 10 feet out or 5 feet out. It's about the zone of a, a football around the tube. And if those neutrons hit 
water molecules, specifically if they hit hydrogen molecules, they tend to slow down. So that device, that, that little probe that goes down into the tube, has a source of neutrons, and it also has a counter, and it counts slow or thermalized neutrons, which have slowed down and bounced back. The higher the count, that means the more hydrogen that the neutrons hit, which means the more water there was in the soil. And so you have a graph. There's a way to calibrate these things. And you calibrate it. OK, I have a certain count. That means a certain moisture content in the soil. The thing is, you can make the measurements relatively fast. You can download the results into a computer. They're pretty sophisticated. You get fairly consistent results. You have a sample area the size of a football. So if you have a lousy tube, if you stomp the ground around the tube, the measurements are excellent for around the tube, but they aren't representative of the field. Now, how do you use the measurements? Here's a typical example that you run into. Let's say you have two fields, a furrow irrigated field, that's row crop, and a drip irrigated orchard, or microspray. And you, they're identical soils, identical root zone depths, same climate condition. You take a reading in the row crop field. You take a reading in the orchard. And let's say you had identical tubes. And for some reason, you came up with identical moisture contents. Now you take a look at the row crop. And you say, hmm, I knew what the moisture content was at field capacity. I know what the moisture content is now. That's how much I need to put in the ground. And that's how you irrigate. You actually take those readings and say, I need two inches net. You might have to put three inches on gross from the pump. But two inches net. And that will bring that soil up to field capacity. Now, let's take the same measurement on the orchard drip. And you say, in that hole, I need two inches. What do you do with the number? The answer is you can't do anything with it. The reason is, if you had another hole a foot away, you'd come up with an entirely different number. Because with drip, you don't wet all the soil uniformly. So the numbers themselves are meaningless. Whereas in a row crop, you try to irrigate all the field uniformly at least in that small area here. And so the assumption is, if you take a soil moisture measurement here, it will be the same as two feet away as three feet away, whereas that's not the case with drip. So how in the world do you measure moisture content in a drip irrigated field? Well, the answer is, you know, you really don't track it that way. What you do is you look for trends. That's how you schedule irrigations in drip, or monitor the effectiveness of your irrigations. You take your readings day after day, and if the readings start to decrease, it indicates that you're starting to dry the soil out. That says you're not irrigating enough hours per day. So you increase the hours per day. That's how you do it with drip. It isn't a measurement that says, I need to put on so many inches. It says, I'm on target or I'm off target. So you don't even need to calibrate a probe with a drip irrigated orchard. The numbers are meaningless. The trends are important. Another device, an infrared thermometer. What's an infrared thermometer? Here's a picture of a unit from uh, Standard Oil. It's uh, called a scheduler. And what you have here is a device that's handheld. There's a little uh, microcomputer assembly that comes along with it. There are other types that don't have the microcomputer in it. But basically what you do is you point it at the crop and you measure the crop temperature. This particular unit has a little computer that integrates other measurements, such as relative humidity, and it tries to estimate a plant water stress. That's basically what you're trying to get at. You're trying to say, okay, given pointing it at a crop, taking into account the canopy temperature, the crop temperature, plus other things like relative humidity and air temperature, is that plant under stress? You don't know how much water to put in, but is that plant under stress? The infrared thermometer by itself only measures air temperature and plant temperature. The concept is, if a plant is under stress, it doesn't transpire as much, and therefore it's hotter than a non-stressed plant. A non-stressed plant, because it's transpiring, will tend to cool off more. It turns out it's not as simple as that. You need to look at relative humidity. You need to have detailed research uh, on the crop to know, so what? You know, So what if it's under a little bit of stress? Is that going to hurt it or not? And if you put all those things together, someday we're going to have pretty good numbers, hopefully, that tell us what degree of stress we have. And that's illustrated here in this slide. Let's say you put 
says you put together several ideas and you come up with a crop stress index. And uh, you generally want to keep it below some certain value. So if the, this value starts to climb, you'd say, oops, at some point we need to irrigate. It doesn't tell you how much, just when to irrigate. Any of these devices, tensiometers, gypsum blocks, there are a whole variety of things. Infrared thermometers, the fuel method, really they all have to go in as part of the package. Part of a package, uh, you don't just use any device blindly. Um, you have to realize whether it's measuring tension, uh, giving you an indication of stress, how accurate the numbers are, and you use them as tools. Something quite important here. If you get hung up on the device, you're generally missing the picture. Because even if you knew precisely that you needed, the plant needed 0.33 inches of water, even if you knew that absolutely precisely, which is virtually impossible to know, you still have the bigger question of how much water should your pump apply because you have to apply extra amounts for evaporation, runoff losses, deep percolation, non-uniformity, that type of thing. And you know what happens when guys get these numbers to the nitty gritty, what they end up doing generally is say, hmm, let's see, I think we need about a third more water for that. You see, if you get down to the nearest decimal point on the, on the plant water use and you just kind of flip a coin in the air and say, hmm, let's fudge it by this amount, where should you put your effort? You should really take a look at improving your system. But uh, we're, we're trying to work on all the pieces one at a time. But don't get hung up too much on the uh, devices. They're all good tools. Irrigation scheduling. How is most of our commercial irrigation scheduling done? This is both for turf. Uh, people are trying to uh, do this more in the turf area and it's certainly been done in the agricultural area for quite a while. What you have on this slide is a flow chart that gives you an idea of the components, some of the components of a typical computerized irrigation scheduling program. I'd like to go through it a little uh, rather briefly here. On the upper left hand side, what you have there is climatic data, generally a weather station. You collect temperatures, wind run, relative humidity, solar radiation. Those values are often their hourly values, that's the best. They're plugged into a computer program, which has a program called, for example, the Penman equation. The Penman equation is developed for throughout the world, gives you a relatively accurate estimate of how much water a non-stressed grass crop would use. Now there's another Penman equation, which has a little different calculation in it, which calculates how much water a well-watered, healthy, alfalfa crop would use with a certain canopy height. Not hay alfalfa because you cut hay alfalfa. This is non-stressed, certain canopy height. So the two Penman equations essentially, one is for grass, one is alfalfa. Basically the same idea, but the results are about 15% different. Of course that's not the crop you're growing. The Penman equation predicts how much water a grass crop, a certain type of grass crop would grow or a certain type of alfalfa would grow. You're interested in getting down to your crop. So you need some additional information. You need to know what, looking at the upper center part, you need to know what crop type you have, what stage of growth you're in. You need to know, uh, you need to have information from other people on, so what, your, uh, let's see, your only 50% canopy cover and your wheat. How much uh, water would a, a crop like that use? as compared to, let's say, this reference grass crop. If you used, if that crop with a dry soil surface and no limiting soil moisture would use half as much as this reference grass, excuse me, grass crop, we would say the basal crop coefficient is 0.5. Now, in addition to that, it may turn out that the soil moisture is limiting. And so you say, whoops, it might use half as much as grass, but really, you see the, the soil is a little too dry, so we have to put that in, and so now maybe it only uses 40% as much. So there's an adjustment of this basal crop coefficient, the KCB. So now you have this coefficient, you multiply that by the ET reference that was predicted with weather data, and you come up with the possible ET of the crop. And really you're looking at transpiration, really. Then you have to adjust that for possible evaporation of the soil surface. Now you bring in the evaporation. 
really finally the bottom thing on the bottom left hand side then takes into account the climate, the crop, the stage of growth, the evaporative conditions that's from soil surface and the possible stress from a dry root zone. You put it all together and you think you estimated now properly the ET of the crop. That's how it's done on commercial irrigation programs. Obviously throughout this whole flow chart there are coefficients, there are judgment factors thrown into the calculations. Obviously you're not going to come out with exactly the right number but if you have good field people who have good field checks if you constantly work with the programs you can get fairly accurate. You can get quite good and you can actually remove a lot of the field work. That's the advantage to this. You can estimate with data obtained for example from from various models and from automated weather stations you can have a pretty good estimate of what's going on in a lot of fields with minimal field work. Evaporation. I've talked about evaporation, that component of it. Transpiration of course, just to reiterate, is the water that goes through the roots and out the leaves and when we put the two together we have evapotranspiration. The factors affecting transpiration I've mentioned here, plant variety, stage of growth, soil moisture, the climate, and the crop health. So ET is a combination of transpiration and evaporation. This is a graph right here, cumulative seasonal transpiration versus time. That's why we have computer programs. Uh, you can see it's not a straight line, it's a curve. And really this should read uh, cumulative seasonal evapotranspiration versus time. This is for a non-stressed crop. If you look at it on a rate basis, you can see that the rate of evapotranspiration changes as the plant gets older, as the weather changes. That's why you need computer programs often to make a lot of calculations on a daily basis. And then you can predict how much the crop used, when you should irrigate, and how much. And you use the soil moisture devices as backup often for verification. So there's the, the graph again and what you see is it's fairly complex and there are fudge factors. What it boils down to is you need good field checks. The minute you leave everything to the computer you're going to lose it. Uh, there, there are too many fudge factors involved, too many problems with instrumentation. There are tremendous aids, they let you do a lot of work, but nothing takes the place of good field man. You get the combination of the good instruments, the good programs, and a good field man, you have a winning combination. Programs which just go with computers generally lose. They generally lose. You need field checks to make sure your numbers are right. And of course, the last thing which we generally ignore is the fact that you have all this good information. Somehow you have to communicate it to the people who are irrigating. And that's really where most of the programs fall down. I'm not talking about computer programs, but all these devices and, and computer programs and everything are great. But if you can't transfer the information, the knowledge, and a few things like three inches, you know, you don't give them all these formulas, you have to give them an answer like, do it twice, something like that, and do it, have a reasonable set of instructions, it's never done. We can have great plans, but it doesn't work. Now the question here, you have soil moisture measurement devices, you have computer programs, all that, you figure out how much the plants need, back to the question of how much water does a pump have to supply? Well, it's more than that, because you have losses. Here's our big basic equation, the fundamental equation that says, what's the definition of irrigation efficiency? It says, well, really, it's a percentage of the water that you beneficially use. And you see, the beneficial use part of it there will be essentially the same for almost any system, unless you stress the plant. Again, a drip system and a furrow system and a sprinkler system really don't affect the evapotranspiration too much, unless you have high evaporation. Where you really find a difference is on the water applied. That's what affects the irrigation efficiency, not the ET. Some systems are designed poorly. They have non-uniform application of water. Uh, they have losses that shouldn't be there. And you have to apply extra water to make sure there's enough for beneficial use. That's how you get poor irrigation efficiency. By the way, a high irrigation efficiency is 90%. Probably a reasonable irrigation efficiency throughout a season for a real good system, it'd be 80%. That's really getting high. Crop yields, a bit about crop yields. What happens if you stress a plant? Two types of plants. The first one we'll look at here on this graph is alfalfa. That's a vegetative crop. You harvest virtually everything that grows above the ground. This is a graph that shows a very important thing. It says, look, if you don't have any transpiration, evapotranspiration, you don't have any yield. 
if you have a little bit of evapotranspiration, you have a little bit of yield. You have more, you have more yield. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that if you put more water on, you get more yield. This graph should be interpreted as follows. Take a look at the 1976 line. It says, really the maximum for that area, for that crop, in 1976, was an ET of about 70 centimeters. And this says, this graph says that if you stress the plant uniformly over the season, so it only transpired 60 centimeters, you have less yield. It doesn't say you can force a plant to use more water. It says what happens to the yield if you stress it. And for a vegetative cro type crop, the basic knowledge that we have right now says that the yield changes from year to year, and we don't always know why. It's going to change from variety to variety. But basically, if you stress a crop by 50%, you get about 50% of the yield. That's what it says. If you have a seed crop or a fruit crop, it's a little different. Here you don't get any yield for a while, and that's because you have to grow plant before you get the harvested product. So you have a zone there on the horizontal axis of ET before you get any yield, and then it takes off. Another graph. This is different now. What's the difference? The difference is now on the bottom, on the horizontal axis, it doesn't say ET, it says irrigation water. And that's entirely different from ET. This graph, for example, shows this is for a vegetative crop again. You can get a yield without even putting any water on the ground. Irrigation water. This obviously has to be a region where you had plenty of winter and summer rainfall. And there was enough water in the ground, you don't even need an irrigation system to get some yield. And there's a point then you get an increasing yield, and then it starts to drop off. The drop off, of course, occurs when you get drainage problems and leaching of fertilizers. Now, let's take the same graph now for the same crop in a different area. The graph looks entirely different. The basic shape is there. It starts at a different spot. This would be for an arid zone. In an arid zone, you don't get any yield unless you put a certain amount of water on. First of all, you have evaporation losses uh, before you even get any yield. And you find entirely different curves, A and B, depending on the irrigation efficiency. Again, this is irrigation water. What's the conclusion? You can't transfer this knowledge. You read an article about alfalfa yield in Arizona and so many gallons of water pumped in a year or so many acre feet applied, it's almost impossible to use that number even on another ranch in Arizona. Why? Because the irrigation efficiency will be very different between the two. And if the irrigation efficiency is different, the amount of that water that was pumped that was beneficially used is different. Okay, now there's an entirely different set of things also that you have to consider. And what I'm trying to get down to is, is this. We see all the time in publications, we see information about people applying so much water and having certain results. And that's great because that's what it ultimately gets down to on an individual basis. You want to get your maximum yield for the minimum amount of applied water. The difficulty though comes when you take that type of information that was generated in another place and try to apply it to your operation. The only way you can really talk about this is to break it down by increments. You have to break it down by how much water does a plant need, which is not the same as the amount of pumped water. How do you fertilize the plant, which I haven't mentioned yet. How efficiently does your, and how uniformly does the system apply the water. And then you come up with an optimal package. If you just jump in and say a crop has to receive a certain amount of water from a, from a pump, you really don't know where you are. You don't know how much was contributed by rain, how the fertility came in. It's very difficult to use those numbers. They're often used to, to promote a certain thing, but it, really they aren't worth a lot. Here's, this slide illustrates another point. It illustrates a real important relationship between proper plant health and water consumption. You have three curves here, indicating three different nitrogen levels for a particular crop, corn. And what you see is that for the same inches of water applied, now these are applied inches, by the way. This is not ET, which of course makes it a bit difficult. But for the same applied water, for the three different nitrogen treatments, let's say 35 inches of water, you get three entirely different yields for the same amount of water. 
What we ultimately want to get to is this concept. We want to go beyond irrigation efficiency and we want to get to water use efficiency. What we really want to do is get a certain amount of yield for a certain amount of water. I want to go back to this one slide here. This slide illustrates something that's quite important. It says, you know, if you don't fertilize properly, for example, you only put on 60 pounds per acre, well, that was the available nitrogen, you could do a bang up job with your irrigation system. All the water could be beneficially used. You could have a real high irrigation efficiency. But because of your poor fertilization, you wouldn't get much yield. And that, of course, is a, a loser, not a winner. So the concept of water use efficiency puts it all together. In order to get high water use efficiency, you need to put the water on evenly. You need to put the right amount of water on. Of course, that involves knowing what's going on with water use and having sensors and uh, monitoring things. And you have to have proper plant health. And then, supposedly, and this is what actually does happen, of course, is you get a high amount of yield for just the right amount of water applied. You get a high water use efficiency. One last topic here, and that deals with infiltration. This is a huge topic, and I'm going to cover it real rapidly, superficially. Um, there's a little bit written down on it. Um, what, what's one of the reasons to cover it fast is because if you cover it in any detail, you really can almost go over the deep end. Um, you either touch it lightly or you get into it in quite a bit of depth. This is an equation, if you look at this equation, called the Kostikov equation, which is one of the equations that you could possibly use. This is the simplest one. Many people don't even think this is correct, that really we should use a more complex equation. But it intimidates most people right away, of course, because you have some value to a power and, and there are two constants in there and you wonder, gee, where did those come from? There is a mathematical relationship between the amount of water that goes into the ground and the amount of time that the water is going in the ground for a flooded surface, for example. And this is one of the possible mathematical explanations. It's one thing to write the equation up. It's another thing to actually find out what in the world those constants are. That isn't so easy. Here's a graphical re representation of what may happen. Let's take a look at a loam. What does it really mean? It says, look, if you had a soil and you put you stacked up water on top of it. And, and you're looking at how fast now does the water go into the ground? And you take a look at that water. You sit there and you look at the water. It's in a cylinder and it's, it's driven into the ground and you look at it. You say, well, hmm, at first the water goes in pretty fast. So the rate is high. It's near time zero. And you watch it and pretty soon it isn't very exciting anymore. The water doesn't drop down very much every hour. In other words, the rate goes down. And finally, it, it sort of steadies out. You have a fairly constant intake rate after some certain amount of time, maybe five hours, 10 hours, 10 minutes, depends on the soil. You get down to what's called a basic intake rate. But the point is the rate at which water went into the ground changed with time. Another way to look at it is if you had a sprinkler system and you had a valve here and you had a sprinkler with a controlled rate of application. You can control the rate with, your, with this little valve here. And you start out and you try to control the rate so there's no water standing on the surface. It's going in as fast as it's coming down. If you were watching the soil and you had the valve in your hand, at first what you would do is you would have the valve wide open and the water would go in the soil fast. And you would notice that you slowly have to crank down on the valve because the soil doesn't take the water in as fast until finally you would be you wouldn't be changing the valve very much. The water would be going in at a fairly low rate. What you see on the graph is different soils respond differently. The rate changes differently. The initial rate is different, and the final rate is different. The idea here on this rate is that if you have a sprinkler irrigation system, let's take that loam again. As an example, just if you knew that, that curve, and you usually don't, but you have to understand the principles. If you were going to irrigate for 10 hours, you would want to apply water with a sprinkler system at a rate, so many inches per hour or centimeters per hour, that would never get higher than that curve. In other words, at the beginning when you start to irrigate, you're irrigating way under the intake rate. You could really put the water on faster. But with a hand moved sprinkler system, of course, it's a constant rate. You have to make sure that at the end of the irrigation, you're not exceeding the intake rate. 
Now that's no big deal. We usually just say, hey, there's one number. The guys have numbers like, what's the intake rate of this oil? Well, 0.25 inches per hour, you know, something like that. Well, it really doesn't work that way. You see this, it always changes with time. Usually when people are talking about an intake rate of well, 0.25 inches per hour, that means after a certain amount of time. And where this is particularly important is when you have systems that are only on top of the ground for a short amount of time, like a pivot or a linear move, and you dump the water on real fast and move on. That's, that's where you're working on the left-hand side of that curve at the high rates. And it gets a little more important to know how that curve changes with time. And of course, that's the game you play with management. You're applying water at a certain rate, and the question is, how long can you apply it at that rate before you start getting runoff? And of course, the intake rate changes. It changes not only while you're irrigating, but it changes with the season. If you have, if you have plants up here that intercept the water drops, well, the water drops don't hit as hard on the soil, so they don't, they don't destroy the soil surface, and the water can actually go in higher. And there, there are a whole number of things. The water quality is going to change it with time. So even if you went out and took detailed measurements and you knew exactly what that curve was today, it's going to be different a year from now. And we just don't have all the answers on it. But you have to understand the basic idea that it changes. It goes down with time. Here's another graph which uh, says the same thing in a different way rather than rate. This is a graph of depth infiltrated versus time. And what you see is that uh, on a clay, for example, down here, and these are just hypothetical curves, but on a clay, what happens is initially you might have a high intake rate, but after a while, no more water goes in the ground. It just about shuts off. And that's the way it happens on some clays. Sands don't shut off so much. With sands, uh, you uh, can put the water in at a certain rate and uh, get in so many inches in four hours. And you know, you might get about that many more inches in when twice that time has elapsed. They don't slow down a whole lot. But uh, heavier texture soils slow down. And so uh, what you see here, though, of course, is, is uh, if you irrigate for twice the time with a surface irrigation method, where the intake rate is dependent on the soil and not on the system, if you irrigate for twice as long with a surface irrigation system, you don't know if 50% more water went in the ground or 30% more. It all depends on what graph you have there. And of course, you don't know exactly what the graph is. So you need special management techniques with surface. With sprinklers, what you do is you have a graph of cumulative depth infiltrated versus time. And that's a straight line because you apply the water at a constant rate. And you always keep that rate below the intake rate of the soil. So with sprinklers, if you apply water twice as long, you get twice as much in the ground. It's very different from surface irrigation. Well, with that, I think I'll, I'll conclude. Um, all of these topics, of course, can be dealt with in a lot more detail. Um, I hope you read the, uh, the text that goes along with it that explains it in a bit more detail. And uh, good luck.